By the time we've come to 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 17 to 19, uh, we have a fairly clear idea of where Peter is going uh, in this letter. Uh, He's addressing readers who seem surrounded by difficulties. And some of those difficulties we've noted are are the result of their being Christians. The fact that they were exiled into parts of what is now modern Turkey may well have been occasioned by their professing the Christian faith. So they were in difficulties. And they were in difficulties perhaps because of their faith. But Peter invites them to look back, to look up and to look forward. He reminds them of what they once were. And he reminds them too of what God did for them. uh, What he continues to do and what he will yet do in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, And he centres his thoughts upon the Lord Jesus as the one who has brought them salvation and the one who has brought them a living hope. And he focuses upon that and tries to encourage Uh, his readers to focus there too and so he tells them them that their experience as Christians is the fulfilment of the longings of holy men and women from centuries past Uh, and it's the ongoing envy he says of the angels in heaven not only uh, is what they experience something and what we experience something that those who've gone before long to see and to experience for themselves but even the angels at this very moment look on and are jealous of us because of the salvation that is ours uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ so Peter says and we've seen this over the last few weeks because this is true he says I want you to get your, your mind engaged your brains in gear or whatever phrase you might want to use to get into the heads this awesome salvation and to focus lives on living a way that shows whose children we really are. The focus of of Peter's thinking so far has been, in a sense, this. Uh, If you are children of God, then live as children of God. If this salvation is yours, then live as those who are heirs of this salvation. If this hope is yours, then live as those uh, who have such a living hope. Now with that in mind, Peter continues in verse 17. Since, he says, this is the case, uh, and you call on on a father, and he goes on. Peter assumes here that his readers pray. Uh, I hope it's not a challenge to you or to me uh, uh, to note that. I trust that we too pray. In fact, we have already prayed this morning. And the prayer that we shared right at the beginning said, Our Father in Heaven. The trouble with words is that they can become cheap in being repeated, can't they? And so we don't take on what we said, Our Father in Heaven. Our Heavenly Father. Now, in the first century in which Peter wrote, For people to have conceived of God as a father was altogether unparalleled. People had all sorts of ideas of what God was like, but to think of him as the best possible father you could ever imagine, and then some, had never crossed their minds. And not all of us have had good fathers. Uh, but the image is one that w- with which we can identify. We know what a good father should be, even if we've not had that experience ourselves. And, and, and Peter says, but you see, we now think of God as the father of beyond any other father we could imagine. And uh, to think that, in the first world, to think that not only God was a father, but that he is my father was altogether mind-blowing. So we say it. We said it this morning. Our Father in heaven. Some of you may have used the same prayer in your own private devotions this morning as I have. So I've said it at least twice uh, already today. Uh, uh, and those words just trip off the tongue and we forget what we're actually saying. But to 
Peter's world and to ours the idea that God is a father is my father is altogether awesome and uh, Peter wants us to grasp that you call on a father one of the reasons I'm a Christian and uh, don't tend to look at other faiths very seriously if I may put it in those terms is that actually no other faith presents God in these terms that's not true of Islam it's not true of Hinduism it's not true of various native religions you might find around the world none of them speak of God as Father that's one of the awesome privileges of those of us who know God in the Lord Jesus Christ so how can it be then that we can call on God as Father? Well that uh, therefore uh, or the four at the beginning of 18 uh, indicates that Peter is going to explain it to us. For you know. For you know what? And in very broad brush strokes or a, we might say the uh, few short touches of a pen Peter explains to us why it is that we can think of God as Father. And he uses some illustrations. People who lived in Peter's time were familiar with the idea of redemption. It's not a word that we use very much. Um, some of us who are a little bit older uh, may remember the pawn shop and having to take things into the pawn shop. Certainly I know members of my family had to in the past take items uh, into the shop so that they could leave it with the shop holder he would loan them some money and eventually when they had sufficient money they could go back and pay for uh, their item and get it back they could redeem it uh, it was possible in the past for people who had themselves become property like slaves for them to have a redemption paid so that they were free and people in Peter's world were well, well aware of that idea of, what it, of redemption. And he applies that here, as you'll see, to Jesus, the payment of a monetary premium to free some, something or someone. In that world, they were also familiar with the idea that sacrifices, animal sacrifices, in some way had, were a means by which somebody, you or I, could be restored to friendship with God or with the gods when Anna and I were in uh, Rome a few years ago we, one of the things I remember was we wandered out of our hotel and down a nearby street and there was this little old church it wasn't any one of the famous churches in Rome uh, but we just it looked old so we st stuck our heads in the door and when we stuck our heads in the door we then discovered it had a crypt and I'm the sort of person who if there's a crypt that's open I want to go and see what's in it uh, so we went down the stairs and underneath this church was a temple, first century temple to Mithras. Now in the first century in which Peter wrote, Mithraism was a religion that was widespread throughout the whole Roman Empire. It's long since disappeared. Uh, uh, but uh, you actually find these little Mithraic temples uh, in many of the sites that were associated with the Roman world. And so uh, we found this well-preserved Mithraeum underneath this church. Uh, and the Mithraic cult was one in which, which believed that, hu that, that animal sacrifices were the means by which human beings could be restored into a relationship uh, with God. The Old Testament spoke in similar terms so that in Peter's world these two ideas are of redemption and redemption by the, uh, the, the reconciliation of people uh, to God uh, through the offering of a sacrifice was ideas that they were familiar with and Peter uses those ideas to explain the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and I want you to notice immediately that he tells us what God has done for us if you were a disciple of Mithras, uh, the things that, that were required uh, to ensure your relationship with God were things that you had to do. But here we have the emphasis upon what God has done for us. It is not that we take the steps to ensure that we're reconciled to God. It is not we who pay the price 
uh, uh, whatever that cost might be to become God's friends. It is that he has done it for us. And the point he's making is that Jesus is God's loving provision for us. He was sinless and perfectly equipped to restore us to God as a sacrifice for sin. And it's by his precious blood, we're told, that we are redeemed. So says, so says Peter, how can we speak to God as Father? Well, we can speak to him as Father, or of him as Father, because of the love that he's shown to us in the Lord Jesus Christ in reconciling us uh, to God. Now, in particular, I want you to notice, he concentrates upon what we're delivered from. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed, from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. Now, if Peter was going to give a complete account of what God did upon the cross in the Lord Jesus Christ, he would have said a lot more than he says here. And he'll say more in the rest of his letter. And other New Testament writers speak uh, about the subject at length, especially the Apostle Paul. Peter here is only concerned with one particular issue. And he says, this life into which you've been brought, this fellowship with God that is now your experience, uh, he says, is a complete contrast to what you once were. Before you became Christians, he says, you, you had a mindset and a lifestyle that was a complete, empty illusion. But now the curtain has been drawn back. Uh, and every true Christian, says Peter, enters into the real world. The real world in which they experience God as a loving, heavenly Father, as the one who is the, as, is the centre of that world, and its motivating force. You know, some of us have been Christians for such a long time that we forget what life is like, or was like for us, before we became Christians. It was an empty illusion. Sometimes we forget as we look out at those uh, walking up and down the streets around us, uh, and uh, those members of our family who don't yet know the Lord Jesus, that they're living an illusion. Oh yes, there are certain hopes that they have, certain fears that they share, uh, a variety of things. But actually, their hopes are not real hopes. Their hopes are an illusion. Ah, and of course, very often the most intelligent recognise that. They recognise that those things that uh, uh, they've placed as the centre of their ambitions and their hopes ultimately tarnish. They don't fulfil what they had once believed that they would. Ah, and they become disillusioned because they were living an illusion. And those in our community and those in our families and among our friends who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ and do not know God as Father through him are living an illusion. Peter began this letter by addressing uh, those he was writing to as strangers. And in a sense, what he's saying here is, strangers you certainly are, strangers more strange than you could have ever imagined. Because you are utterly different uh, from those who live a life that is a mere illusion. Peter makes one final point here and that comes in verse 17 right at the beginning since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear the best fathers are fair minded and deserve respect plenty that don't and none of us do perfectly but the best fathers are those who are fair-minded and deserve our respect. And what Peter is saying is that's supremely true of our Heavenly Father. Uh, and we honour him by living in ways that do not prompt him to feel he needs to discipline us. 
that we, if we love our parents, that we will want to please them. We won't want to put ourselves in a position where we displease them and place ourselves in a, at a place where discipline may be required. And Peter is saying because God is our Father and we know he's our Father because he loved us in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and he did everything that was needed to bring us back to himself. Then he says, you and I should live as those who are children of that heavenly Father. Now we'll notice that Peter has still not got down to the nuts and bolts of how we should apply this. How then should we live? He's still speaking at the level of motives. And what we've discovered over these last few weeks is that what Peter wants us to grasp is this. We're to live pure lives because God is supremely pure. We're to conduct ourselves as children of the Heavenly Father in order to show that we are actually his legitimate children. And we're to respond as we should to the fact that he is fair-minded, honourable and above all outrageously self-giving in his love. And if we have any doubts of that we simply have to look at the cross. So Peter's not saying to you and to me today this, you must do this, you must do that. Uh, he's inviting us to ask perhaps more profound questions. Uh, is my life a pure life? If others were to see inside me in the way that I perhaps see myself, could I say that my desires are that I should be holy as he is holy? Uh, is my lifestyle one in which uh, folk might take, catch a glimpse of the fact that I am actually the child of a heavenly father? Oh yes, I'm the child of my earthly father and there are things that are very similar uh, between what my father was and what I am now both in looks and in temperament in other ways and folk who uh, knew my dad will sometimes note those similarities but is it true above all that I and you share by the way that you live evidence show evidence that you are children of the loving Heavenly Father. That's the challenge that this passage brings to us today as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words of the Apostle Peter. We're so grateful that this man who knew the Lord Jesus so well is able to share with us something of his own experience and the things that he has learned the priorities that he has grasped in his own life and his own discipleship and is seeking to share them with us Peter was certainly one who made mistakes and the Bible isn't slow to remind us of those mistakes. But Peter was also one who learned. And so we pray that you would help us to learn, to acknowledge our failures, to look to you for forgiveness, and to seek that grace that we need to live in such a way that we show that we are children of a loving Heavenly Father. Help us then, we ask, as we offer our prayers to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.